Uh, I'm Elliot Gerson, and it's my great privilege to welcome all of you this evening. The Institute has just concluded its 10th Aspen Ideas Festival, capping a decade plus of unprecedented growth, success, intellectual vibrancy, and social impact under the terrific leadership of Walter Isaacson. I'm delighted. <laughs> Uh, I'm delighted to welcome many of you here for the first time to the Aspen Institute. One of the wonderful things about the Socrates programs is that every year about half of the people have never participated in anything before. The other half are people who come back, many of them year after year after year. And of course, to welcome all of the stalwarts who have supported the Aspen Institute over the decades, and especially this last decade of extraordinary excitement. And you're here, of course, to support the Socrates program, uh, one of our most wonderful programs, but also, of course, to thank and honor Leonard Lauder. <laughs> Leonard is a towering embodiment of the Aspen idea in all of its manifestations, and a visionary champion of young leadership. And he's also a man I am very proud to call a mentor, an advisor, a colleague, and a friend. We have a great evening for all of you planned. We gather to celebrate a program that now has almost 20 years of history, bringing together young leaders from all around the world, from myriad professional pursuits to discuss, explore, and pursue paths to leadership in our age's greatest challenges. Later this evening, Walter will moderate a conversation with Leonard on the lessons that he has learned about leadership over the course of his life. The Socrates program has now brought more than 5,000 people together under the stewardship of passionate and distinguished moderators on topics domestic and global, technical and cultural, practical and moral and represented here tonight by six superb moderators. Socrates has not only provided emerging leaders from all over the world with an opportunity to explore contemporary leadership questions, but it has also created an important gateway for people to join the Aspen family more broadly as they continue their paths of lifelong learning. Socrates alumni have also become trustees, Henry Crown Fellows, members of our Society of Fellows, of our Vanguard Society, uh, speakers at the Aspen Ideas Festival, our Aspen Leaders Action Forum, and contributors to our now more than 30 policy programs. We hope that this group of 100 Socrates participants this weekend will continue their involvement in many ways in the future. In 2012, the Socrates program expanded to international markets, including uh, its first seminars in Cuba and in Spain, and it broadened its conversations here on our campus, both in our July seminars and our February seminars with nationals from more than 30 other countries. Later this year, we will hold our first seminar in Mexico City, and hopefully next year or soon thereafter, we will be conducting Socrates seminars in Ukraine, in Japan, in Portugal, and many other countries as this unique and powerful program gets more and more popular. This global expansion is a natural and not coincidental complement to Leonard Lauder's extraordinary leadership of the expansion of the Aspen network of international uh, uh, partners. We now have Aspen Institutes in 10 other countries, and we will say a little bit more about that in just a minute. We are extremely grateful to all of you tonight for your support of the Socrates program, especially to our patrons and our host committee. Through your generosity and your desire to honor Leonard Lauder, we have raised over a half a million dollars tonight. This is an all-time record for the event. Thank you so much. 
Your help will help assure, your support will help assure the, the continued and sustainable growth of the program, and most importantly, guarantee that our seminar tables continue to be represented by scholars who provide so much diversity and perspective to the topics that are discussed. In this regard, I'd also like to give a special thanks to Kathy and Walter Isaacson for establishing a scholarship which has enabled Teach for America alumni from uh, Walter's native New Orleans to participate in Socrates and be with us tonight. Thank you, Kathy and Walter, for that. The Socrates program is indebted to Leonard in many, many ways. Two decades ago, he challenged his son and his daughter-in-law to find a way to integrate younger people in the, in the programs of the Institute. And that led to the program's uh, uh, founding. More recently, he, su he provided support uh, for uh, a gifted director to run the Socrates program, our marvelous Melissa Ingber. <laughs> Melissa, please stand. And, and he co-chaired an endowment campaign to make the uh, uh, continued growth and, and stability of the Socrates program uh, possible. He also established the Bill Buttinger Scholarship to support an annual, an annual scholar in public service, and that scholar is here tonight. Finally, I'd like to thank Leonard personally for his support of Socrates, and also for his extraordinary leadership in the expansion of the network of Aspen International Partners. These are both programs it's my privilege to oversee. The last years of Leonard's leadership of the International Committee of the Board saw unprecedented growth, success, vitality, and cooperation in our international network. The network has absolutely never been stronger, and let me tell you that it could not be possible without Leonard's personal leadership. Uh, were it not for Leonard Lauder, Aspen Germany would not be celebrating its 40th anniversary this October. Were it not for Leonard Lauder, we would now, we would not have Aspen Prague, Aspen Spain, and now Aspen Mexico. Were it not for Leonard Lauder, we would now be look, we would not be looking forward to another series of extraordinary developments in Aspen Japan and now the transition from its founder chair to a new chair. And this has been a challenge. It's required uh, global insights and diplomacy. It's frequently required contact with uh, foreign ministers, with our State Department, and has required someone with the, with, the, with the subtlety and nuanced understanding of global affairs that Leonard has. His personal leadership, his personal generosity has made it possible. Just a couple of months ago, we gathered the, all of the Aspen International Partners uh, in Prague for a wonderful celebration of the <clears throat> 25th anniversary of the fall of communism in the Czech Republic. Leonard wasn't able to be there, but representatives of the other partners were there. They knew that Leonard would be honored tonight, and they wished to express their personal support and, and appreciation to Leonard. And so I'd ask you to watch a very short video from our international partners meeting in Prague. Thank you, Leonard. Greetings from Prague. We've just had a very successful meeting of our international partners, and we offer uh, our extraordinary thanks to you, uh, a passionate and committed champion of the international partnerships. Thank you, Leonard. This is uh, your baby or one of your babies, and we all thinking of you here in Prague very gratefully. And. Uh, this is your family member, so anytime you feel like coming home, we wait for you here. Thank you very much. Domo arigato. Merci, Leonard. Je te connais depuis 1980, c'est-à-dire il y a 35 ans, et tu es toujours là. Thanks a lot, Leonard. Grazie mille, Leonard. Leonard, thank you so much for the leadership you provided for the International Committee over the years. As someone who has observed what has been going on internationally with all of our affiliates, it's very clear none of this would have happened without your leadership. So thank you, and I'm sorry you're not here in beautiful Prague. Gracias, querido Leonard. 
Hi Leonard, this is Rudy from Germany, Aspen, Germany. Deutschland liebt dich, Deutschland braucht dich and Deutschland wird dir deinen Beitrag und deine Unterstützung nie vergessen. Germany loves you, Germany needs you and Germany will never forget about your contributions. Thank you so much. Muchas gracias, Leonard. Dear Leonard, we're standing here in Prague uh, in this beautiful city uh, with all your friends and colleagues. Um, I too want to offer my sincerest and warmest thanks for your vision, your leadership, and your generosity um, in all, over all these years, especially with this family of international partners. I also want to personally thank you for your friendship and your mentoring and your good advice and stellar insights. Шановний Леонард, хочемо подякувати вам за вашу підтримку, за ваше бачення, за вашу візію і за все те, що ви робите для Aspen спільноти не тільки. Dear Leonard, I'm so happy to be able to add my good wishes and thank you for everything that you've done for Aspen and specifically for these amazing uh, international programs and the various Aspen institutes all around the world. You are really the spirit of Aspen and you have been a fantastic supporter and a really, really good friend to all of us, especially to me. So thank you very much, Leonard, for your incredible work. And, and finally, on behalf of the Institute, I would like to thank Laura and Gary, uh, the dinner co-chairs, for their vision and their unflagging enthusiasm to launch this program and then to sustain this great program. So please welcome Bob Steele, our chairman, to the podium, along with our dinner co-chairs, our new trustee, Laura Lauder and Gary Lauder. Bob. Thank you, Elliot. Uh, as he said, my name is Bob Steele, and I speak to you this evening on behalf of all of my fellow trustees of the Aspen Institute. Many of them are here tonight and excited like me uh, to be here to honor our own Leonard Lauder. But first, let me also say my thanks on behalf of all of our trustees to Laura and Gary for all they've done to basically launch Socrates and put it on such an incredible path that Elliot described and also even more recently with their support for the Franklin Project for national service. I think Gary and Laura deserve a great hand too. So now, uh, as you've heard, we're all excited to be here this evening to honor uh, Leonard Lauder, an extraordinary in individual who personifies all of the things we talk about with the Aspen Institute with regard to values-based leadership. It's a phrase we use eas easily and it comes off our tongue, but to live the life of values-based leadership is something extraordinary, and I think we're all quite keen to hear Walter engage with Leonard and talk about some of these issues after dinner. Leonard first became involved with the Institute when he took the Aspen Seminar in 1978. He then continued uh, taking other seminars where he learned the Young President Seminar, the Global Commons Symposium, and Leadership and Character Seminars. And in the boardroom, Leonard's always been a strong advocate for two things. One is the importance of our seminars and the idea that a moderated discussion with people of different perspectives can really raise the knowledge of all the seminarians to a very special place. As Elliot said also, he's done extraordinary things with a vision, much like he made his company become global. He's also taken the Aspen Institute on that same journey and basically allowed us to go to new heights in the international area, just as he did with his own company. Leonard, really, and I could go on and on, but I'm going to try to keep it brief. I'd just like to highlight three things that, that have been important to Leonard that we can all learn from. And when you look, whether it's education, healthcare, and the arts, and Leonard's involvement is not shallow, it's deep in all these areas. And his commitment to the University of Pennsylvania, and is also similarly, whether it's to the Breast Cancer Alliance, or whether it's to his focus on Alzheimer's in medicine, he's also gone very deep. And lastly, uh, we all know what he did, and Bob Hurst is here really as a, an early leader of the Whitney to take it to extraordinary places, 
and then just recently, recently with his magnificent gift to the Metropolitan Museum, which will stand the citizens of New York and all the world when they come to New York for decades and decades to come. So really, on behalf of all of my fellow trustees, it's our privilege to count Leonard as our fellow trustee. He brings all of us great honor every single day. So we're happy to be here this evening on behalf of that. Thank you so much. What can I say about my sweet father-in-law? First, I have to say that there are a hundred fans of yours right out here. Socrates participants, wave. <laughs> Woo, all right. We have had a phenomenal first day at Socrates, and we're about to have two more days. And it only is here as a result of your leadership and your inspiration to us. Who is the person who you trust to discuss your most difficult decisions? Who is the person with whom you strategize about the direction of big projects? Who is the person in whom you confide your greatest concerns about problematic situations? And who is the person who you look to for inspiration and enlightenment? Who is the person who is always just a phone call away to get a generous dose of encouragement, enthusiasm, and support? You are most fortunate if this person is all at once your mentor, your friend, your confidant, your supporter, and your father-in-law. Leonard, you have been all of these to me. While your son is my soulmate, you are my compass, my thought leader, my inspiration to do good in the world. Mark Twain once said, it is curious that physical courage should be so common in the world and moral courage so rare. You, Leonard, combine all these rare qualities of diplomacy and moral courage that inspires us all to do and be our best. So, um, you know, the fact that this event has been sold out for six weeks is uh, a testament to how many people ad admire my father. And, uh, but it's also the case that the room is filled not, not just with admirers, but with a lot of people who really, really love you. Um, not, not that many people are lovable, but my dad, <laughs> My dad really is. So, um, and I am, I'm so fortunate to have him as a role model in many, many ways, both business and family and being a renaissance man and so forth, but mentor and the best father in the world. And so I'm so grateful. Um, I thought that I, uh, it might be nice to tell um, a little bit of the story of how the Aspen Institute has been, um, and, and he were intertwined in some wonderful ways. And so uh, we always used to come skiing here every winter, um, maybe twice a winter. And, and then um, my mom got, no, my, um, my mom got invited to the Aspen Institute, but my dad wasn't, so then they didn't go. But then, um, but then they both got invited and came in 1978, as Bob mentioned, and they fell in love. Uh, with the institute, they were already in love <laughs> with each other, um, and uh, and so um, and that summer uh, they uh, saw a real estate agent, uh, found the property right next to uh, the institute, uh, bought that, and found an, found a local architect, and two years later our family home was built, and um, and then in Aspen and the Aspen Institute has been a major part of all of our lives as a result of the Aspen Institute. So, um, uh, and that, that summer, I believe, or shortly thereafter, he also joined the Board of Trustees and has been its longest serving member. Um, and uh, I was so, 
Um, and the, the Aspen Institute has been through a lot over the years. Um, and uh, not many people know how uh, he has helped it through many different crises. Um, so I thought I'll only tell one that is so far back in people's memories that no, one, that no one's alive that'll be insulted. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so. Um, uh, so a, um, a long time ago, in the uh, early 80s, uh, and even in the 70s, um, the, there wa the town and the Aspen Institute had a town-gown kind of conflict, and uh, the chairman at the time, Robert o. Anderson, um, did, uh, was not appreciated by the town, and it became mutual. And, the, um, and so uh, the institute, under his leadership, decided uh, um, to move elsewhere. And so it, it bought a campus in, in Baca, Colorado, and it sold off the meadows, uh, and uh, it was uh, on its way out. And through uh, my dad and, and other more enlightened trustees, uh, this eventually got turned around. So there are, um, there are many such stories uh, since then, but it's um, the kind of moral courage that Laura was talking about to stand up for what is right and just. So. Um, uh, um, and uh, Elliot mentioned uh, my dad's involvement with seminar programs, but I just want to touch on that a little bit more. Um, the Institute does many, many things. Um, it, it started off doing seminar programs, and that's been uh, what had the most profound effect on him. And for many people who come through and enjoy the seminar programs, it's been a, a very, very formative thing in their lives. And so he's been an enthusiastic champion of that, and uh, and been and the and it's been a mutually beneficial relationship for many years. Um, and I'm a venture capitalist, and. Um, uh, in venture capital, just as in real, in real estate, it's location, 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 venture capital, is, it's management, management, management. And my dad has um, been, uh, was one of the first people to recognize a great opportunity for great management in the form of Walter. Um, and, uh, and, um, and, you know, Walter's great leadership, um, you know, A, A players hire A players. And so the, now the entire Aspen Institute staff is really exceptional. And, uh, I, you know, the, um, uh, it, it starts with the, the board uh, putting the, the right people in place, and then it flows on through the organization. So, and that, that's true of everything that he gets involved with. So I consider myself the luckiest son in the world, and um, the Aspen Institute is also lucky to have you and your special form of love as well. So if you could come up here, we would like to present you with... Uh, Do you want to look at it first? Yeah. Sure. Okay. So, so th this is a, um, a, a photo book um, of... Uh, um, many of which the photos you see on the screen of my my dad and his in involvement with the Aspen Institute over the years. So, um, and in the back there's a CD with all these photos and the the video. Oh, Gary and Laura, thank you. Bob, thank you. And thank you all. But you know, you sometimes give me more credit than I'm due because the chairman of the nominating committee at the time we hired Walter was not me, but Bill Mayer. And Mr. Bill Mayer, would you please wave or stand up so we can see you? So thank you, Bill. And thank you, all of those who who were on the nominating committee with me at the time. But, you know, this is a very, very special moment for me because uh, this is something that I've looked and watched and watched grow. Now, but I'm really a proxy for Gary and Laura Lauder because there's a power of the idea that was a Socrates seminar and that came from them. But there's more than just the idea, say, here's the idea, will someone else do it? No. They did it. The, they used their Rolodex. They used their vast acquaintances and friendships. They bent arms, pleaded, invited, whatever it is, including putting all those people in my house. <laughs> Thank, Thank you. you. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> 
I can't walk around just in my underwear anymore, Gary. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but um, if, if any of you have ever uh, tried to undertake the, uh, uh, the role of recruiting a group of people for a seminar, imagine this. They have recruited 4,000 people already to come to the Socrates program since its founding. 4,000 people. And uh, Laura mentions uh, availability. My phone rings every evening between 11.30 and 11.45. And I don't even look at the caller ID. I pick up the phone and I say, hi, Laura and Gary, who's on the line? And the answer is usually one of the two, and we talk about it, and we get our problem solved. But the Aspen Institute is also a beneficiary of the power of an idea, but bring that together with the power of one. Let's take Lauren Gary as one. Walter Pepke, founder of the Aspen Institute, uh, about, against all problems, uh, the town didn't want to have him here, and all those elite people, etc. Gary and Laura founded the Socrates program, and they were involved not only with the recruiting, but with the ideas, but with getting the moderators, etc. It took a while, but look, the power of one, the power of their work, is so extraordinary. So I congratulate the two of you for what, for what you've done. <laughs> but, but look, but not only have I thanked them and all of you, uh, but I want to thank all of you and share something with, with you. We're in the Door Hosier building in the McNulty room. Okay? Now, most of you, many, some of you do know them, but many of you don't know John Door and don't know Jerry Hosier. Uh, many of us more know Ann McNulty. The Aspen Institute was founded by Walter Pepke. No one is alive that remembers Walter Pepke. The, many of the things that we are doing today came from money given to people, given by people, to make sure that we today would be able to benefit from it. And your presence tonight is not a matter of saying, here's some money to do what you're doing now, is really, here's some money to do what you're doing for tomorrow, for tomorrow's leaders. So your being here tonight and supporting this dinner, not only is an honor to me, and an honor to the past, the Walter Pepkes and the Mortimer Adlers who helped found the Aspen Institute, but you honor the people who are coming after us. We are all a little bit concerned about politics in America. If enough people can pass through these doors, and learn the, the concept of values-based leadership, we will never have problems in this nation. So it's what you're doing and you, what you've done tonight that I honor and thank you because you're doing great things for this nation and you've made me very proud to be part of your mission. Thank you all. Thank you. Wait, 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 wait. I'd like you to see the latest fashion statement. Okay? 30 years ago, they would have called us communists. <laughs>
And I think I should have a plan for world domination and spread and grow. And he said, I like you. You're hired. <laughs> so that was it. Uh, but it is, to me, uh, an important lesson that I've learned in leadership from Leonard. And so if I may, Leonard, let's make that the topic. And let me start with a simple question. Do you think great leaders are born, or do you think they can be trained? Yes. <laughs> Did you also see that movie, Lost in Translation? OK, look, I believe that m almost everyone has a leadership quotient inside of them. There are some people who are really born uh, to lead, but 95% of the people who are our great leaders today have learned along the way. Now, I'll give you a simple question. If you're with a group of people and someone says, where shall we have dinner tonight? And you say, let's go so-and-so, okay? You have just exercised leadership. And that means you have it in you. If you said, wherever you want to go, maybe not. Maybe not. And so if your wife says, you love me, darling, you have to say, yes, dear. That shows leadership. So, uh, <laughs> but we, we all have it inside of us, and it's just a matter of learning how to bring it up and to use it wisely. And so don't think that you can't learn it. However, book learning sometimes works. It usually doesn't work. Uh, look to see who wrote it. If, he, if the word is so-and-so, a PhD after it, forget it. Forget it. Now, you took the Aspen Seminar for the first time in 1982? 78. 78, you yeah. came here, and that's yeah. when you took the seminar yeah. for yeah. the first time. Yeah. Did it begin, still begin with Plato back then? It's still being added with, yeah. yeah. How, what was Plato like? <laughs> I plead the fifth on that one. <laughs> what was Mortimer Adler uh, like? Listen, Mortim uh, Mortimer Adler uh, was a genius, and... Uh, However, if you ever sat in one of his seminars, uh, he wouldn't be as kind as many people would expect someone to be. Instead of saying, oh, that's an interesting idea, he'd say, you're wrong. Okay. But um, can I tell a Mortimer Adler story? Okay. Um, and uh, this, this, this talks about a delegation also. Um, um, Mortimer and his wife Caroline came to New York City, and my wife Evelyn and I took them out for lunch in the Cote Basque. And, uh, and the Mortimer said uh, he was about to celebrate his 80th birthday, at, and uh, Columbia uh, was where he had graduated. And he said, you know, Columbia never gave me my degree. Because, I said, why? He said, because they ex you had to pass swimming in order to get an undergraduate degree, <laughs> and I didn't want to swim. I didn't want whatever it is. And so... My wife, Evelyn, said, Mortimer, wouldn't it be wonderful if Columbia gave you your degree, your undergraduate degree? He said, I would love that. Evelyn turned to said, Leonard, get him the degree. <laughs> How now, much did that cost? That, that is delegation. <laughs> now, that's the first leadership thing that you should all learn. <laughs> uh, but by the way, look, I got him the degree, the real degree. He marched in the procession, even though he was 80 years of age and wanted to, to be on the stage. He said, no, I'm marching with the students. And we gave him a graduation party at home, and I gave him red swimming trunks as, 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 a, as, a, as, as a gift. Then, two weeks later, is anyone here from New York City? Okay, good, yeah. We have one or two. Uh, two weeks later, I received a call from the, uh, the principal of D. Wynn Clinton High School. He said, Mr. Lauder, do you know that Mr. Adler never got his degree either? Well, you had to swim it to wet Clinton? <laughs> how, do you, um, how do you spot or train leaders in your business? Well, um, I have an instinct. And I, somehow or other, I can pick them. And I've never been wrong. Uh, and the I got come, uh, really. But, but I want to tell you, the biggest problem that I have is there's someone I think is no good, but uh, if, I, if they report to someone else, I can't say, 
you're fired. If I go to that person, he says, well, no, give him a chance. And I say, look, dumb is forever. He says, no. no. <laughs> so, <laughs> so the thing that I've always regretted is that I haven't been able to, uh, that, that I haven't been able to convince people to get rid of someone who is really dangerous. Um, but I mean dangerous, in some cases, dangerous. Okay, but how do you train leaders? Um, you start them off in jobs that you know they can't fail at. The worst thing you can do is put someone uh, in a job that is a little bit over their head that you worry about whether they can succeed. Because if they succeed in a smaller job, they have confidence. Uh, uh, just to tell you one little thing, uh, you, you, many of you know what I do for a living. I sell lipsticks, I sell cosmetics. Okay? And, um, and you go into a department store, you see women in uniform standing behind a counter. We have high turnover because very often uh, they come there, they just don't know how to sell, whatever it is, and after a week they say they're discouraged. If we teach them how to make one sale, they say, hey, this is easy. I'd like to do more of this. So get someone started in a smaller job, smaller something, and help them through it. Don't throw them into the water, let them sink. Help them to succeed, because if they succeed, they'll have the confidence to be able to be a true leader. You mentioned a moment ago that dumb is forever. But I want to ask you, uh, based on me? that, no, no, no. Um, what is the correlation, which may not be as strong as some people might think, between high intelligence and good leadership skills? And if the correlation isn't exact, what are the other traits that make for good leadership skills? There is some correlation, uh, not with IQ, but with EQ. So if you have emotional intelligence. Uh, but um, in some cases, if you have high intelligence, that may hold you back depending on where you live. For example, in the UK, I would never hire someone with a Cambridge or Oxford a, a degree. Now, they, 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 maybe as a mailroom boy, but uh, 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 that's it. Why? Because they think they're hot stuff. And, uh, you know, I have this degree. You know. I, I always wanted someone who was hungry because hunger drives ambition. And if you're ambitious, you'll learn to be a leader. You'll learn to do what you have to do. So uh, there are some people, however, who are so intelligent in general that it gets in their way because they think they are so smart they don't understand anything. Uh, that um, bec It's hard to really say, but there are some people, uh, we usually... Uh, have failures in people who are overeducated with uh, with too many degrees, because um, uh, there was an there was an article written in the U.S. Naval Institute of Proceedings. It used to be in the Navy, in, in another life, uh, that was entitled "Why Smart People Make Bad Dumb Decisions," because sometimes you're so smart, you think you've got it all, but you really don't. What did you learn in the Navy about leadership? Well, uh, firstly, I was 22 years of age, and suddenly I was an officer. And uh, the first thing I learned uh, is to use my ears, because I walked into my first job, and uh, this guy said to me, he was a, I was, by that time, I was an ensign. This guy was a second-class petty officer. He said, Mr. Lauder, you do just what we tell you to do, and you'll be successful. I did that, and I was successful. And later on, when he got out of the Navy, I hired him, and he became one of our great vice presidents. And, uh, I hope you gave him the same advice he gave you. Do just what I tell you, you'll be successful. So, but um, listen, the best thing you can do is surround yourself with people who are smart and know their jobs, and you appreciate them and recognize them and make them, make them your strength. The strength of any organization are the people. The wealth of a company is their people. However, remember this, you are only as good as the people who work for you want you to be. 
So your job is to have them join you in whatever it is you want to do and make you look good and be better. When you, uh, as I said, hired me, you had only one question, which is, would you keep the Socrates program? I assume you have other sets of questions when you try to spot talent. What do you tend to ask people? Okay, well, firstly, I want to th tell you all a story. Walter attended a Socrates seminar uh, before he even officially joined the Aspen Institute because he knew that was a hot topic, and he went there to learn. So good on you, Walter. Thank you for that. Thank you. Uh, I learned how good it was. Yeah. Okay, look. Uh, people need to be able to understand, if I may, what is expected of them. And they have to be able to... They have to be able to understand your vision. If you can't share what your objectives are, then that's hard. So now Walter said, what questions would I ask? So that's the background. Okay. No, okay. Supposing you're interviewing someone who has a skill that you know nothing about. For example, you're, you're interviewing a guy, a chief accountant, a chief financial officer. You say to him, or him or her, tell me, what is it that you're proudest of doing? Tell me, what's the one thing that you've done that you really feel good about? And someone says, such and such. Okay, do me a favor. Can you please tell me exactly how you did it? How did you come up with the idea? How did you explain it? And t explain it to me so I can understand it. It works 100% of the time. Because if someone is trying to blow smoke in your eyes, you will know it. <laughs> What are you proudest of doing, and how did you do it? Okay, it's truth. Picking great people. Uh, whenever I go into a meeting or anything, and I see people who are really succeeding, I feel good about them. And how about Walter? I, are we happy with Walter? Come on, come on, come on. Now, but give, give me an example of a tough leadership decision you made and how you went about it. Okay. Um, well, I'm not, I can't say that I'm proudest of this, but I, we run a meritocracy. And uh, I don't like keeping people who are not doing their jobs uh, because I don't, because, uh, some, a lot of people are afraid to fire people. Uh, so I was very unhappy with our head of research and development, doctor, 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 whatever his name was, uh, the smart guy. And so, uh, so I called him into my office and I uh, spoke with him and I told him that uh, we were saying goodbye. He said, I was wondering what took you so long. Okay, what that tells you is that you think there's someone invaluable, everyone knows the drill, okay? <laughs> if someone isn't pulling their weight, everyone else knows it. And if you're the boss and you won't get rid of that person, you know who's at fault, you know who's, who's, who that reflects on? You. So that your job is to make sure that you have good people. Now, I fired... I, I fired in my t time, more senior executives than all of our four CEOs after me combined fired. However, with one exception, every one of them considers me their mentor to this day. Because I, I helped send them to a place where they could do better. By the way, a lot of people are afraid to fire, but may I say something on this? A lot of people are afraid to fire people. You know, you're no good, let me tell you why. Now, what I, and here, here's what's in my mind. I said, everybody in this world has worth. The fact that we have been unable to take advantage of your skills and make it work for us is not your fault. 
It's our fault. So we talk about it. I wrap my arms around him or give her a kiss, depending on if I give him a kiss, I'm in trouble. But, um, <laughs> and, and they walk out of there happy because I haven't said what was really wrong because maybe it's not really wrong. Maybe we put the wrong person in the wrong job. And sometimes I will recycle someone and put them in another job and they flourish and they fly. So if, if someone isn't, isn't doing a good, a good job, there's a point beyond which patience becomes neglect. It's wrong to have too much patience. Uh, when you were an early seminarian, you got to meet a young Tony, uh, Tony Kobayashi, right? And didn't you meet him at one of the seminars here? Yeah, he, would, he, was, he was with me at the Wharton School. Yeah. yeah. So, but you, he came to you yes, with Aspen, yes, he did, too, yeah. right? Who was uh, president of Fuji Xer right. Xerox at the time. And that sort of began your plan for world domination, right, in the Aspen Institute. Tell me how you came up with the whole expansion of Aspen Internationals. Well, I didn't invent that. Thank you. Uh, it started with Joe Slater, uh, who was the president of, the, of Aspen several years ago, and uh, he had been um, he, he had been with uh, John J. McCloy in in Berlin, uh, and John J. McCloy or Jack McCloy was was the uh, was the was the high commissioner, I think, high, high commissioner of, of Germany. Uh, they decided to form an Aspen Institute in West Berlin, okay? and uh, and that got started, and that was the place where it was a western bastion in the middle of this very difficult area. People flew there, they came there, and they, and, and they spoke openly and freely. And that, that, that was the beginning, I think, of this great idea. So I didn't expand it, I didn't start it. It, it was started by others. And uh, I won't take the credit that, that, it belonged to, that it belonged to others. And uh, from Berlin, uh, Tony Kobayashi got interested in doing it in Japan. But no, so, no, the second step was Aspen, Italy. And Dick Gardner, who's a lifetime trustee of the Aspen Institute, was the US ambassador at the time. And he knew a guy named Johnny Agnelli of Fiat. And the two of them decided that they would launch the Aspen Institute in Italy, which is today one of our bright crowns, or our bright stars. So that uh, others did it. And the key thing here is that we understood it. And it, it's our job to stand on the shoulders of these giants that started these things and make them even more successful. Mm -hmm. I, we, uh, it was mentioned your art donation which I think may have been the law, is the largest art donation in history from a private person, whatever. Um, tell us about that donation and how art has helped inform your notion of leadership and values. Do we have about an hour or two? Okay, uh, then, then I'll, I'll try to cut, uh, forget the donation, but by the way, I'm coming back here, August, is, is it August 11th? Yeah. Uh, Amy, yeah. uh, August 11th, and for those of you who are here, I'm going to take you through it, uh, the good and the bad, how something is good, how something is bad, how I found this and how that, and what about fakes, etc. cetera. Uh, but let, let's try just one thing. Uh, it's everything that, you, that I bought had to be, that, that had to fit the 3 O test. O, oh my, oh my God. <laughs> if it wasn't an oh my God, you don't buy it. Now apply that for one minute to the caliber of the people that are surrounding you, no matter what they do. If they don't hit the 3 O category, maybe they don't belong with you. Who are, this will be my last question, but who are your heroes, people you've looked up to in terms of leadership in particular? Well, the, uh, a lot of people who, a lot of people who I never knew, uh, they're probably, um, 
uh, Alfred Sloan, the former chairman of General Motors, who brought Gen GM through the depression and they never missed a quarter. Uh, he, and, but he's the one also who, who, put, who put together the complex of different brands under one com company. And when I joined Estee Lauder in 1958, uh, in those days, uh, every cosmetic company was a cosmetic company. Revlon was Revlon, Elizabeth Arden was Elizabeth Arden, Helena Remsen was that, et cetera. I looked at Alfred Sloan's work, I looked at GM. I said, you know, that makes sense. Why don't you have one company that has multiple brands that overlap a little bit and compete with each other? It had never been done. And uh, I said, well, listen, you might as well try it uh, because uh, luckily, uh, my parents, Esther and Joseph Lauder, who I loved dearly, left me alone. They didn't know what I was doing. And so, that, <laughs> thank you, mother, thank you, father. <laughs> that, uh, and, uh, and, and like GM, uh, all these companies I started, and then uh, I never put the Estee Lauder name on there. So when we launched Clinique, it was Clinique, not Estee Lauder's Clinique. So uh, is that my idea? No. It was Alfred Sloan's idea and, uh, and, the, and his predecessors. So, so that there is nothing really new in this world and you can learn so much more from other things uh, that, are, that are being done. So that uh, if, uh, if you keep your eyes open and your ears open and your mouth shut, you will learn things because you can't learn anything with your mouth open. <laughs> well, I hope that the Socrates program will produce a new generation of Leonard Lauders. Thank you, Leonard. Thank you very Thank much. Thank you, Walter. Thank you. We have only one toast to celebrate Leonard, and it's from another stalwart who has kept the uh, Socrates program afloat and a admirer and a close friend of Leonard's, we've asked Bill Budinger to give a toast. Bill? First, I think I could speak for all of us and say, Leonard, thank you. Thank you for all you've done. Thank you for your incredible generosity and wisdom, and particularly for being you. So I would like to propose a toast to Leonard Lauder, all of our hero, and uh, wish you a long and happy life and more great success. Thank you. Thank you. To Leonard. Here, here. Thank you. May I? I mentioned to you something that you are only as good as the people around you want you to be. So I'd like to close my comments with a toast to the person who has helped Socrates every day to make it great. Melissa Ingberg, would you stand up for a minute, please? <laughs> Melissa. <laughs> Melissa, where are you? <laughs>